Printer, uh, the Robert Hofstadter Memorial Colloquium. This is the colloquium by the Robert Hofstadter Memorial Lecturer at Tom Zeilinger. I gave him a full um, introduction last time. I think I will give the short form this, uh, this afternoon. Um, I'm sure that most of you know that we are living in a revolutionary time in physics. It's the time of information. It's the time of entanglement. And I'm going to be very brief and simply say that Anton is one of the heroes of the revolution. He was there from the beginning, or close to the beginning. And his experiments have really set the standard for the study of entanglement. He is very eminent experimental physicist with many awards and many uh, distinctions, among them the Wolf Prize. And I won't, I think I will just sit down now and let that time. Uh, <laughs> oh, okay. So, whatever. Okay, thank you very much, Lenny, again, for inviting me and for your kind introduction uh, yesterday evening. I, uh, today I will I, I choose a title which says Quantum Entanglement in Higher Dimensions, which is kind of a non-committal title, so you can, <laughs> <laughs> which is part of the, of the story. And I will talk about many loose ends today, so many things which are going on where, where we, to be honest, don't really know where, will it, where, it, will, where it will lead to. But this is what fascinates me about, about what we are doing. Uh, okay. So let me jump right into the thing. When we talk about uh, about uh, description of states of light, we all we, let us restrict for now. Let's talk about polarization in a simple way. And you see the standard representation of a qubit here, which is a general superposition of horizontal or vertical polarization. This is a, uh, because this is how we do it in the lab. You could write zero or one one here or whatever you name it. Then uh, one, possi uh, one possibility is to combine more and more uh, qubits uh, to get higher dimensions. For example, if I uh, combine two qubits, I have dimension four. I can go on like that. I will talk a little bit about, about this. Uh, or I can uh, also, if I want to go to higher dimensions, I can define the state of the photon in uh, many modes, in many paths. Uh, path. Uh, uh, many different ways of position with many modes and so on and so on. So this is just uh, a little introduction. Uh, one point which is, uh, from our point of view, uh, uh, important for some of the experiments that we are doing is how to uh, uh, how to realize uh, uh, in operations in Hilbert space in experiment. And it turns out that I have learned that this is maybe uh, uh, known in, in communication theory for a long time. But for us, it was new a while ago that you can realize any uh, unitary operator uh, uh, in the laboratory. If I have any input modes and I have any output, mo output modes, you can realize any unitary operator. Uh, this is now uh, well known, but about, uh, 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 the, the, by a combination of just uh, uh, matrices like this, two by two matrices, where you have some reflection coefficient and some uh, some phase. You could actually, in addition, you can even even replace uh, those by by interferometers. <coughs> Here is, for example, the general uh, three by three matrix, uh, uh, as I said, uh, which can be realized in the way I just mentioned practically in the laboratory. Here is an experimental realization how things work. Uh, what you see here is the on top is the, the uh, realization of a general a beam splitter with arbitrary reflectivity. And it can be, it can be built up out of 50-50 beam splitters. So the final story is that you can build up any unitary operator here out of 50-50 beam splitters and phase shift. But you don't need more than that. So that is the realization of, a, of an arbitrary uh, beam splitter with an arbitrary reflectivity r, where the phase is related to the reflectivity this way. And here you see the scheme of a, of a general 4x4 four four tunable multiport for a general uh, unitary operation, this 4x4 four four 
uh, uh, space where you have a photon or whatever is coming in in any super in any state you want, and you can get out any any state. Now you can see that these things are not are not simple to build. Uh, they require many elements and so on, and that is the experimental challenge. If you talk about entanglement, you might ask yourself what is new if you go to entanglement in higher dimensions. And the question is, I would say, the point is that we really don't know the honest answer. I think this is, this is now, I say this now because I want people to get excited and can go home and start working out what will be new in higher dimensional entanglement. Yes? When you say dimensions, are we talking about space, Hilbert space? I talk Hilbert space dimensions here. Sorry, I talk. Well, I, I talk Hilbert. I mean, in that case, for example, it was the, the four modes which represent orthogonal states in a four-dimensional Hilbert space. For example, right? Thank you. Uh, so, so I have, I have. Uh, uh, let us consider, for example, this is a specific example of something uh, interesting happening. Uh, we have we consider a source which produces uh, entangled states of two photons in a in a uh, in a, in a uh, superposition where where this mode uh, the photon one goes to the left side the photon right goes to the right hand side and this mode uh, this mode is correlated to this one mode one mode two is correlated to two mode three is correlated to three so you have a three term superposition in the tangent state. One, one, plus two, two, plus three, two. Okay? And then here is your general unitary operator, which we call trita. It's a generalization of the splitters, trita. Uh, and, and, and then you can ask yourself, uh, you, can, you can now turn the machinery and easily calculate all the possible correlations. But that doesn't really doesn't tell you the physics. It doesn't tell you the intuitively what is going on. And there's something interesting going on already on the level of perfect correlations. Yeah, if I might remind you, I mentioned that briefly in my talk yesterday, if I have an entanglement between two qubits, two, two state systems, then you have uh, the, si uh, the situation that you have perfect correlations whenever the two in a certain entangled state, let's assume it, uh, uh, it's just uh, uh, horizontal, horizontal plus vertical, <coughs> vertical Whenever the two polarizers are equal, whenever you use the same operators, you get perfect correlation between the measurement results. And this, and this is interesting because this case can be explained for, for two qubits by a local realistic model. We know this was actually part of the discussion yesterday. As soon as you have three particles, the perfect correlations cannot be explained anymore in a, in a local realistic model. This is, this is, there, there are literally three particles in two dimensions. Now we're talking about two particles in three dimensions. And uh, so the first question here to ask is, how do the perfect correlations look like? And the interesting point is, is that there are uh, two different classes of perfect correlations. This is one class, and this is the other class of perfect correlations, where, uh, where you can switch uh, 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 where you can <coughs> there's no way to switch locally between these two classes. Uh, what this means, we don't know. It might be interesting, it might not be interesting. Uh, what we simply did is in the experiment, we, we realized these correlations. I should mention one important point, and that is uh, for three state systems, you have what is called the Cochen Specker theorem. The Cochen Specker theorem says that uh, if I have a three-dimensional quantum system, I cannot assign, even for, uh, for commuting observables, I cannot uh, assign values of, of the measurement results uh, for uh, uh, independent of the context of the, of, the, of the whole measurement. So I cannot assign uh, to uh, the three-state systems, for example, uh, three uh, components of the spin one system, and uh, I cannot assign uh, measurement uh, results to uh, one component without the definition, without the con independent of the context, context of the other measurements. So this is the Cox-Baker paradox. Uh, the basic, uh, what it basically says is that uh, you have already a situation of, of uh, one particle in more than two dimensions, you have a conflict uh, with a realistic world view. Now, what would be new, and that has not been done yet, is that you can use uh, this kind of uh, situation, two entangled particles, to establish 
the, the measurement results of the Cochrane Specker experiment as, as, ele as local elements of reality. So they would not be just a, a, fi a fiction in a sense, but you can establish by, by a perfect correlations, you can establish them as local elements of reality, and therefore you would make the corresponding arguments much stronger. Here is how, uh, uh, again, a conduct situation, how the experiment will look like. You have a source, we have two unitaries to the right and left hand, and you look for for the for the correlations between the two sides. Uh, uh, by the way, the way we, we uh, all this is now done in in micro optics, and the way the phase shifts are done is by simply heating the local uh, uh, local uh, waveguides by s small ohmic resistors. And it seems in our experiments that this can go up to frequencies of the order of one kilohertz, which is not very fast, but it's, it's decently fast. Here's the real experimental realization of such an experiment. The work was was uh, the PhD thesis of Christoph Schäff, you saw the name before, uh, who just recently finished his work. Uh, so what you do is you you pump you pump here you pump here. This is the uh, the pump. Uh, uh, three nonlinear crystals. These are uh, periodically poled lithium niobate crystals. Three nonlinear crystals. You pump with one pump here coming in. Disregard these pieces. They are here for automatic uh, uh, aligning uh, of the of the of these interferometers. Uh, so you have an incoming wave. It's split by big two beam splitters, uh, such that these three crystals are pumped and. Uh, and the phase matching condition is chosen such that you have uh, a collinear non-degenerate down conversion, which means that you create the uh, pairs of photons collinearly, which are uh, which are uh, which have slightly different wavelengths. Lambda one, lambda two, blue is lambda one, red is lambda two. And then we use uh, wave uh, uh, wave front uh, uh, division. Uh, 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 multiplexing here to separate the, the different uh, wavelengths. So you get uh, uh, wave photon 1, you know, pairs are created, photon 1 with wavelengths lambda 1 is then combined into this, is then, is then in these three modes, in these three orthogonal states, photon 2 is in these three states. And then you have your unitary operators and you look at the perfect correlation. Or, uh, or any other correlations. Here's the experimental results again. Uh, the, the, the correlations uh, uh, between between uh, uh, two sides is a function of relative uh, phase, and these are the two different classes of correlations which you expect. So let me, uh, that is just the status of a recent experiment. We, we also did dimension four, and it's it's an obvious question: what can you do with it in the end? And there I have to say, I want to challenge the audience. Okay, <laughs> what, what, I mean, there, there's a, a whole field now uh, of, uh, of quantum random walk and all this in this kind of dimen uh, dimensions. I don't want to get into this, but in terms of fundamental physics, the question is open. And I want to set the stage here now what the, what the, what the issue is. Uh, if you look back historically, let us consider uh, 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 how many particles have been have been studied in this kind of experiments, have been used, states of how many particles and dimensions. So if you start with n, and at every, every state something interesting happens, I would argue. If you have n, capital N is the number of particles uh, in the quantum state, and D is the dimension. So if you have uh, n equals 1 and just a one-dimensional system, you have Born's rule. You have the probability which gives you well, and the Bohr's rule, which is actually interesting from a fundamental point of view, because we know that in quantum mechanics, randomness is of, of a different nature in classical uh, mechanics. <laughs> Einstein, uh, uh, not Einstein, uh, Heisenberg called the randomness in classical mechanics subjective, and the randomness in quantum mechanics objective, for obvious reasons. Then, uh, if I have one, still one particle or one system in dimension two, I get quantum interference. No two slit interference, all kinds of interferometers, and so on. If I have n equals one and dimension three, I get the Cohen Specker paradox, which I alluded to uh, briefly. Uh, if I take two particles, each one defined in two dimensions, I get EPI and Bell. 
if I take three particles, each one in two dimensions, I get GH set. So whenever we made a step, we find something interesting. So why does it stop here? I claim for years that there must be very, very interesting things going on in higher dimensions. We just haven't looked at them in the right way yet. This is my personal suggestion. I'm not talking about obvious generalizations of Bell's theorem to higher dimensions. There's a lot of work, but this is not really conceptually something new. OK? Now, one interesting question where, where I've been, uh, you know, as a, as a simple-minded experimentalist, have been worrying about for some time, and where some people tell me that, that this is a very deep issue, is the question, and I just throw it out here again as a, as a, as a, uh, uh, maybe, you know, uh, something interesting. Maybe somebody wants to work on this. It's the question of how many mutually unbiased bases, MUBs, exist in the Hilbert space of dimension D, little d. Okay? Now let me first define what are un uh, mutually unbiased bases. If I have a, uh, just in a real space, if this is a, uh, a, a basis, of my of my space here, then a mutual mutually unbiased basis is, for example, this basis here, rotated by 45 degree, which is such that the projections of a, every a base state here on all the other uh, on the on all the base states in the other bases is of equal length. So, in other words, in the language of information, if I encode some information in that basis, okay. It does not reveal the measurement in the, in the, in the mutually unbiased basis does not does not reveal any information because of this uh, mutual unbiased thing. Now one can easily see by just counting parameters that for a Hilbert space of dimension little d, there are at most d plus one mutually unbiased bases. So far, that is uh, not anything critical. Then. Uh, the story. Go, the, then the, the question is: Do t plus one mutually unbiased bases exist in the Hilbert space of the general Hilbert space of dimension d? And the point is: This is a very simple question where the answer is not known. The answers are known for some cases for, by construction of the bases. Uh, if you, if I take uh, this was here the uh, the authors. <laughs> Uh, Ivanovich showed uh, that if the uh, uh, Hilbert space has, uh, is a prime number, then the uh, mutually unbiased space then exists. Then there exists just d plus one mutually unbiased spaces, and they are all of a very simple structure. They are all the simplest Hilbert space for a two dimension is the is is uh, is a, a spin a spin one half, okay, spin one half. So dimension two, so there must be three mutually unbiased bases, and it's clear what they are. They are the eigenstates to sigma x, sigma y, and sigma z. So that's that's nearly obvious. Okay? The eigenstates of sigma x, sigma y, and sigma z. Okay? And uh, furthermore, what's interesting is if you have the, the eigen if you have the basic if you have one basis, then the states in the other bases are, can be written as simple superpositions of the of this first chosen basis, right? For example, if I say if I uh, there's the state plus x plus x, it's simply one over square root two uh, plus uh, z plus minus z, and so on. Okay, simple superposition. And one would one would figure uh, this is ought, to, ought to be always that way. If I have an arbitrary Hilbert space, why doesn't it always work that way? That I take one basis, and the other other all the other mutually unbiased bases can be expressed that way. The answer is no. This is not possible. And that's actually fascinating. It has been shown. The first interesting uh, case comes in when you have uh, the fact that the so when you have Hilbert spaces where the dimension is a power of a prime, of a prime, for example, uh, two square, uh, two to the third power, two to the fourth power, and so on. There it has been shown by Wouters and Fields long time ago that by construction, constructive proof, 
that you also have d plus one uh, mutually unbiased bases, uh, but most of them are entangled. That's interesting. The point is, if I pick now, precisely speaking, if I now pick pick one uh, uh, one one basis, which is uh, of the standard structure, you know, uh, very simple uh, uh, for uh, 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 four vectors, for example, in a four-dimensional hidden space, then some of them can be written down this way here. Some of the other new mutually unbiased bases can be written down here, but uh, but most of them for high dimensions can only be written down as entanglements of the original basis. And that I find very interesting. Uh, it, it can be seen mathematically how it works. I'm still lacking the intuitive understanding why it should be that way. And if you go to very, very high dimension, the set of, of factorizable bases becomes of a measure zero. Now that's quite, quite fascinating. Then, if, if you now go to so, the, so we have covered now the prime dimensions and the powers of prime. What happens with the general order, you know, general uh, 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 integer number, like 6, 2 times 3? And the question is that there is no, there is no proof what happens there. There have been searches by people may, in many ways, different, there are different arguments, this goes now very, you know, very deep, uh, mathematics where I have no chance to understand what is going on, to be honest, but as an experimentalist I'm interested in this kind of question. Uh, they, they, for example, for two, 2 times 3, uh, 6, it's an open question of whether seven dimensions exist or not. The guess, the general understanding of the, of the, <coughs> the community is that it is the smaller of the two prime factors which determines the number of mutually unbiased bases. So in the, in, the, in the case of 6, 6, uh, which is equal to 2 times 3, then the number of virtually unbiased bases is not 7, but it is 2 plus 1, which is 3. And I, fi I find that extremely fascinating. Why? Because to me, the number of mutually unbiased bases are the ways, different ways, how you can independently encode information into a system. Just as I said before, right? Now, why in the world should, if I have dimension 6, there should be less, fewer ways to encode information independently than if I have 5 dimensions? It doesn't encode information independently. Oh, it means that it means that this, uh, the way I said it before, if I encode information in one basis, it does not tell you anything about the about the uh, about the uh, information in the other basis. Right. And for a three dimensions, for a spin one half, I have three such ways. Sigma x, right? Sorry. For five dimensions, I have seven. I have six such ways. For six dimensions, suddenly I have only three. <laughs> and that's somehow it's, uh, I don't know what it means. I, I, I told you that I want to tell you some <coughs> open questions here. Here are some of the bases which you can look at. You can look uh, at for uh, dimension uh, two is uh, no. This is obvious. There's nothing to talk about. To be talked about for dimension four, two qubits. Uh, this is in, uh, you see the, the the basis of the uh, of the uh, for for, uh, for dimension two. There are three unintended bases where. One and two are the basis of, of, of system zero. Uh, of, of, of one and two subscript zero are the basis of of, um, of one system where there's a misprint. And and one, I don't know. No, no. Uh, these are the three unintended uh, bases in the in the three cases where one uh, uh, where one sub zero, one sub one, one sub two correspond to the to the eigenstates in the corresponding uh, basis. This would be, for example. Uh, x, pl x plus, y plus, and z plus. If I take a standard representation x, y, z, and uh, there are three bases which can be written just as tensor uh, 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 products of this, and there are uh, uh, five bases which can only be written as entanglements. And it gets worse for higher dimensions, as I as I, as I, I mentioned before. Here is the case of three by three by three by three. Where you have four unentangled bases because 
uh, uh, one of the factors determines uh, how many of the unentangled phases you have. So three plus one is four, and uh, there are there are another five entangled phases. Uh, if you go to uh, dimension six, there are probably uh, only the three unentangled bases which I show here, and, pro and probably no more. Intuitively, that makes somehow sense. Because if I say that there are only three, namely two <coughs> plus one unentangled bases, then the others should be entangled if they existed. But there's no way to sensibly completely entangle a two in the three dimensional system. So there, there's some connection to entangling material which is interesting. Uh, Okay, I don't want to bore you with this. So this was this was part one of my talk. Uh, part two, uh, I have to look at the time. Part two of my talk is on how to realize high dimensions and what to do there with orbital angular momentum states. And finally, I want to mention a little bit about these uh, about these uh, imaging experiments where the first slide was taken from but I might not have much time for going into detail. But there is another small uh, seminar which I will give on Thursday at 12.30. Uh, Is that correct? 12.30 in, uh, in, in, in the theory group. So. OK, so for those of you who have not familiarized themselves yet with the orbital angular momentum states, uh, this is an interesting set of solutions actually of the of the Maxwell equations in the paraxial approximation. Uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the phenomena is very simple. Instead of just having a plane wave front, you can have wave fronts which are helical. Uh, and uh, this opens up a whole new zoo of many possible possible uh, uh, new states of light. I showed this picture already yesterday. I show it here again. Uh, they are the two different uh, ways how how light can carry uh, orbital angular, angular momentum, spin orbital, uh, orbital angular momentum, the way you know it. Uh, the usual way. This is a, sig a sigma equals zero state, a horizontally polarized state. This is just okay, or a, a, a state with some some uh, a circular polarization. Uh, so this is the intrinsic, intrinsic uh, or internal uh, uh, angular momentum. And besides that is the uh, external angular momentum, which I just mentioned, where you have instead of plane wave fronts of the finite size, which is uh, just plane waves, you have these screw type uh, uh, wave fronts. I will say a little bit more about, uh, the, about their structure in a second. The important point from the quantum mechanics point of view is that uh, uh, for consistency of uh, the uh, if I take a if I take a, a, a loop around around the central propagation axis here the phase has to be a multiple of two pi so the, so this so the number how many multiples of two pi you have is called the topological charge of the cell and it's an integer and the interesting point is but quantum mechanically, uh, such a state carries L times H bar angular momentum per photon. So a photon can carry, in, princip in principle, an infinite amount of, of angular momentum, a single photon, because of that feature. Now, there are all kinds of questions which, which you can ra uh, uh, raise. For example, one is the limitation. What is the limit here? It turns out that the, that the minimum size of these states grows linearly uh, with the square root of the topological charge. <coughs> so the, small, the smallest state is a Gaussian beam. The size is given by the Gaussian base of the beam, which is given by the parameters of the experimental setup. If you, uh, under the same conditions, the topological uh, 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 higher modes are larger, which actually can be used to filter them in a, in a unique way. This is a, a consequence. Uh, uh, so, so this, 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 uh, so these modes 
Che il lascia, 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 il should not be any fundamental limit, I would guess, but this is maybe, maybe I'm wrong here. Now, the way, they're also called Lagia Gauss modes because they are the, uh, uh, in the paraxia approximation, the amplitude distribution is a, is a solution of the Lagia uh, 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 equation. And here you see the intensity distributions of some of these modes. This is LG00, it's the Gaussian mode. Uh, it's, a, it's just a maximum in the middle, there should be not be a black dot here. Uh, LG01 is a mode which carries one unit of angular momentum. So the phase when you go around here goes from 0 to 2 pi once. 0 to 2 pi once. In the middle you have a singularity because the phase is undefined. And this actually, this singularity, which is helpful in propagation through turbulent media and so on, because the singularity is rather stable against this turbulence, the ex existence of the singularity. And we, when you go to LG02, you have a, a higher mode, uh, and you get uh, from 0 to 2 pi twice, and so on and so on. There are additional, is a, a complete di uh, additional mode set. Uh, there's a second index by which you describe these modes, which are, is mathematically very defined, but intuitively this is still something which uh, is discussed. Uh, there are additional modes uh, where you have uh, additional internal maximums, you have multiple rings. The mode itself has still uh, uh, the same topological charge, so the same uh, winding number, the same number times 2 pi the phase, or the same uh, uh, h bar, multiples of h bar angular momentum as, as the mode without additional rings, but there's this, this additional information here. Now, uh, the, so there are two indices. Uh, the second index, index is the so topological charge, and the uh, uh, L, and the other one is this additional uh, uh, quantum number uh, which it can be, which is smaller, which is smaller than L. Now, uh, what is in, what is interesting is the phase structure of these beams. Here is the possibility how you can make those modes out of a mode which has uh, which has uh, a Gaussian mode, which has a homogeneous phase distribution. Uh, 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 the phase distribution for an LG mode is just going from 0 to 2 pi once. So you, when you imprint this phase onto a Gaussian mode, you get, the, uh, you get this like yeah, Gauss mode is charge 1. Charge 2 is twice, charge uh, 5 is this one. And for the internal modes, you just have to flip alternatively the, uh, the, the, the phase by pi uh, between the rings where you make them. So, uh, now I want to come to entanglement. There was a nice uh, situation in 19, uh, was, was it 1989? There was a paper out, I don't mention the authors, uh, which said that uh, this feature is not entangled when you have a, when you have a standard thumb conversion situation. So you could imagine the following situation. I have a standard uh, nonlinear of crystal, uh, like here. <coughs> I have a standard nonlinear crystal, and I create, this could be, for example, what is called pipe one down conversion, but that's irrelevant, where you have momentum and tangent. And uh, you have uh, two modes coming out. And you can now ask yourself, is, uh, uh, these two modes, uh, are they entangled in orbital angular momentum? So that simply means it's now, it's a much richer question than in, 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 in standard, uh, standard uh, uh, spin case, because in standard polarization case, the term which comes out is just two terms. It's one over square root two. If you have just for, uh, something like H V plus V H, 
all right? In, uh, in, this is a type 2 function that should be like that. Now, uh, the question is whether these modes are also in thing. Now, if there is something like conservation of angular momentum in the process, then the state should be something like that. It should be 0, 0, topological charge, plus, plus 1, minus 1, plus minus 1, plus 1, plus, plus 2, minus 2, and so on, and so on, and so on. Okay? Infinite number of terms. And I only, I only showed you the, uh, 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 I only, I only wrote down the main quantum number, not the, not the other one here. I, I, more basic confusion. You talk about photons that have an arbitrary angular momentum. Right. It's a state that I'm unfamiliar with. Maybe right. other people are too. Uh, is there an obvious physical description? It, are you talking about states maybe that have um, not well-defined number of photons? No, no. It's a very different. It's a single photon. Okay. A single photon, I, I should go back to that picture maybe, to this picture here. This is the wave front. Okay, this is, uh, if you just consider first the wave front of, of, a, uh, of a wave from bottom to uh, top propagating through space. And consider, the f uh, consider just consider for a moment that the wave front is a, is a screw. It's not a plane wave, but it is just a, a, a screw like a staircase. The staircase is a better example. A, 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 wind, a, a winding staircase, okay? Which is a, a legal solution of the Maxwell equation, okay? And then if you have this kind of winding staircase, like this, right? Uh, then, uh, you can ask yourself what kind of solutions are allowed. Is it and it's an eigenstate of the number operator? Uh, it, no, it can be any state. It can be it can be in terms of numbers. It can be a coherent state. It can be a, a number state. You you name it. It's not important. It's a mode. It's not. A mode. It's a mode now. It's a mode, and we can populate that mode if you want with single photon states. Or we can populate it with two photon states. It doesn't matter. But if I populate it with, if I if I know the uh, photon number in this in this case, <laughs> case, then the the angular momentum of the state is just n times l times h bar. So each photon, each single photon carries l times h bar angular momentum. So you're not in a vacuum. There's some potential. There's some vacuum. No, this is vacuum. A propagating vacuum. This is a pro this is a solution of the vacuum Maxwell equation. A propagating vac vacuum. These are states which have long been overseen in, in in physics. I don't know why. They were recovered by Bergman and, and colleagues in the early 1990s. Okay. It's quite it's a quite an interesting feature of the of the system. And the and the states propagate by the way not quite with the with the vacuum speed of light because they have some small divergence. They have some small divergence and therefore the average speed of the state is a little bit below the vacuum uh, speed of light. Well, there's a leading edge of it, which must go with the speed of light, no? Oh, the leading edge? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So we know since at least the days of Priyat that any any uh, non-analytic part of the distribution yeah. function propagates with the speed of light. Right. Yeah. Did, did that help a little bit? So, yeah. so I talk really, I talk literally about individual photons. Okay. So in the experiment, I, I literally talk about I have uh, photon pairs, and now I ask if they are entangled in this new property. So if, if I so which would mean the following: if we, if you recall my my le lecture of yesterday, entanglement means that that before the measurement on these two systems, it is wrong to assume that the 
uh, two systems have the properties which I will then observe in the experiment. But one measurement collapses, projects the whole system into a specific product state corresponding to this one measurement result, right? In horizontal, in polarization it's easy, if I project this one onto horizontal, then the other one is projected onto vertical and vice versa. The question now is, this is supposed to be a complete mixture of all possible pro uh, uh, possibilities. Now, if these states are momentum entangled, I have situations like, like that I have pairs like that, but I have pairs which are, all, which are slightly different and correlated. There's no, there's no other color, and there's also green. I have other pairs which are like that, for example. So it's the superposition of all these possibilities. And that means that, I, that the state is rich enough to also make these clinical states as superpositions of different K modes. You can, right? The state is rich enough in principle. You can make, you can make out of this, you can make a helical mode. And uh, the question now is if I project this onto, an, onto a specific state with a specific helix, uh, would the other one be projected on the corresponding helix. And there was a nice little was a paper which said no, this is not the case. And we figured we had we figured this must it must be wrong. Because every prop every property should be intended if you do it right. There should be no limit. So we did an experiment where we actually showed that the state is like this. So you really have entanglement uh, for uh, in, in the beginning just for three modes. But, but you can do it for, for higher modes. Mm -hmm. Then the question now is, for, for how high modes can we obtain entanglement? So the two questions I want to discuss now, where we did experiments, is just for the fun of it, to be honest. The question was, for high angular momentum modes, for how, to how, for how high topological charges can I realize the uh, uh, in the states, and can I realize even entanglement? Why do we ask this question? Because many people think that, they, that high quantum numbers are the classical limit, which is not our viewpoint. To put it very simply, high quantum numbers are not the classical limit. Okay? So, how do we do the experiment? Yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. If these are bosons, which I assume they are, the so photons are usually bosons, yes. yeah. <laughs> uh, why is L minus L different than L minus L? Oh, I should say what this means. What this simply means is here, I, just by analogy, I'm, 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 oh, I see. by analogy, yeah. this state, this is a pre abbreviation. This is really the tensor product of right. photon one. Horizontally, photon two, vertically polarized, plus. Yeah, but, but they're distinguished by one going one way, the other going the other. That's right. And these are also distinguished that way. Ah, okay. These so are also distinguished that way. So, so I L doesn't completely characterize the, uh, the mode. That's right. So I consider two photons, one going this way, the other one going this way. And the first one either, either being minus L or plus L, and the other one correspondingly being L and minus L. Okay? And this is what we want to realize. This is what we saw basically in this experiment, but even richer. And we are now we are now asking ourselves how can we go? How, how high can we go? Okay? And the way how this is done in, in, in experiment is at first uh, the 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 uh, uh, well I should go I should go right away to to this uh, maybe I should go to this set up or maybe not uh, let's see well we now we, let's put it that okay, okay no I should I should first talk about this a little bit uh, so we so we so we uh, let's suppose we have an incoming linearly polarized photon okay just no. It could also be a, a classical state. It doesn't matter. Okay, uh, and I, I have here a polarizer which splits, uh, which is oriented at 45 degrees, uh, a, a, a polarizing beam splitter at 45 degrees to the polarization of this photon. Then uh, one polarization state will be reflected, the other one will be transmitted. 
then I, I send these, these disregard these pieces, they're not important. I send each of them onto the onto a spatial light modulator, which is a device. We don't have to know how it works. The photon is reflected from it, and you have pixels there, and with these pixels you can program to it to imprint a different phase for each pixel. So you can program it to imprint, for example, this pattern on the <coughs> photon, which is the phase pattern, as you saw it before, for say this must be about what L equals uh, 10 maybe. Okay? And on the other one, you, you program to uh, for the opposite state. So the photon, which is which is it, which is the photo state which comes here is now is transferred into an orbital moment uh, angular momentum state and the other photo is also transferred to the other no the other mode is also transferred to an orbital moment or angular momentum state but uh, opposite states <coughs> correlated to polarization <laughs> then you insert the polarizer under 45 degrees to that polarization which means now that the state coming out is a superposition of these two modes Okay? And then the step to entanglement is just to build the whole thing twice. Have a source here, which produces that state here, sends the two polarization entangled photons to two such devices, which means that horizontal is transferred to minus L, vertical to plus L. Here, horizontal to minus L, vertical to plus L. And now you have this entangled state. You now have a state in two different modes. <coughs> Where, where photon 1 is either minus L and plus L, photon 2 is either plus L or minus L. And what this says now is, is that you have these photons, uh, uh, each of the states is still a statistic mixture. They don't have a well-defined angular momentum state. But if you measure one, if you project one onto one of this, uh, these states, the other one is immediately projected onto the corresponding one. And furthermore, <laughs> If I project, which is even more interesting, if I project this state onto the superposition of the two, and we have to talk about how superpositions look like, which is interesting, uh, then the other one is projected onto the corresponding superposition. Okay. Now here is how superpositions look like. Um, this is a, a, a real. This is now of a classical beam. You know, not 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 the not the single photon beam. I have to look at the board. Uh, a classical beam, not a single photon beam, is a superposition of plus 100 and minus 100 units of topology in charge. Why does it look like this? Uh, at first, just disregard the multi ring structure. That's an imperfection of the experiment. So important is just this bright ring here. What you see here, you, have to, you can count it if you are quickly. You see here two, <laughs> 200 maxima. You see 200 maxima. Why? <laughs> this is easily understood. A photo state with L equals, I should make it a graph again. Oops. I should make a little graph again to make this understood. We don't need this anymore. So I, I simply, I write it in a very naive way. Here is one mode, and here is the other mode, this ring structure. Oh, I should. I should uh, say, I would like to say one point, which is really important. Namely, if you look at the solutions already according to the Maxwell equations, if you, if you ask yourself, what is the intensity inside here? The, okay, the, or the amplitude of the field, same, doesn't matter. Uh, if this is R, then, okay, the, the field strength, so it could be E or E squared or whatever, it doesn't matter. Uh, as a function of R, it's something like that. The important point is that this grows with R to the Lth power. That simply means if L equals, for example, 100, 
the intensity is zero until you reach the, the rim. And this is, this, I would suggest this is a perfect cage. You know, it, you don't realize that there are the walls because it's really, it's, you know, it's very, very, suddenly the intensity goes up. Now that's the side of my uh, okay. What is so. it, what's bounding it at r equals whatever the maximum r is? Hmm? It's a maximum r. Right. What what is bounding it at the maximum r? Is it a cavity or what? what is there is no bound. There is no bound. It, after after what? I've forgotten how it falls off. Oh, I thought, I thought you were implying that it goes up and then ends. It goes up. It has its maximum and then it it it. It ends outside. Uh, the, it could go out on outside. Outside what? Outside this ring here. This ring stuff. Yeah. What's providing the ring? Any this is some physical ring that's. Um, yeah. It, no. But it's, it is not. It is just the boundary condition of the whole setup. Uh, let me see how how is it defined. That's a good question actually. <laughs> I mean, we do it. Now we do it. I mean, we simply do the experiment by sending our our laser beam, yeah. uh, the Gaussian laser beam, onto the onto the face, uh, onto this face modulator, and we get out this ring structure. And I never worried what what defines it out there. I used to say something which was wrong. I used to say that uh, the size of the ring is given by the by the criteria that the, that the difference between this maximum and the superposition cannot be smaller than the wavelength. But that is wrong. It turns out that we found that this, this is wrong. Uh, what is a good physical? I don't know. I, don't, I can't give one. This is <laughs> there's, there's still open questions here. But I'm sure somebody knows. I, I just don't know. Now let us go back to this to this to this picture. So I have one mode L equals plus 100, which means that the phase goes uh, but, uh, 0 uh, pi, uh, 2 pi, uh, 100 times. And here it's the same, but the opposite direction. 0 pi, 2 pi, again 100 times. That simply means if I superpose the two now, then 200 times the phases agree, and 200 times they are completely out of phase. And that's the reason for the 200 maximum and minima. <coughs> and now this is, all, this is now an immediate way to identify what superposition you have in front of you. So if you have such a ring, it's, and if, it, if, the mix, if the minima, if the minima are well, uh, you know, there's a sharp criteria but later, but the, the uh, minima are well pronounced enough, then you have an, a superposition of plus L, L and minus L, and you just have to count the maximum and the minima. And this is also a way how to practically do the experiment. Okay? So in that experiment, and, 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 and uh, in a general uh, uh, entanglement situation, you don't, you just don't like, if you, if you test uh, Benz inequality, you just don't, uh, you don't, uh, you look not only onto the eigenstates of polarization, horizontal, vertical, but also on superpositions. It, but superpositions with arbitrary phase. So the question is if I have a superposition of, say, plus 100 plus e to the i phi minus 100, how, how does the phi come in? Well, the phi then obviously comes in. By, by if I change the phi, I would rotate that pattern. Okay, so the precise position of the pattern gives me gives me the the number phi here. Or if I now uh, project onto a state which is slightly rotating, I project onto a different state for then unrotating, and that gives you the full richness to test space inequality. So what you see here is. For the case of L of the state 100 minus 100 plus minus 100 plus 100, you see these sinusoidal uh, oscillations here, measured the coincidences. Uh, the parameter of these curves is, is the setting uh, of, of this angle phi on one side, because the, what you do now is, or what we do in the experiment, 
you simply have a mask which has 200 slits in the case of 100 200 slits and if the mask is aligned with that pattern maximum go through if it's shifted it not, nothing goes through okay so you can set the mask at some angle which corresponds to the polarizer setting in a polarization experiment it's a one-to-one -one analog so you set one side on, on three different or four different angle settings and then you look at the coincidences uh, as a function of the orientation of the second mask and this is just like having one polarizer here rotating the other through in the Bell experiment setting it different and rotates through and down and we know from the standard test of Bell's inequality when in each case you get a sinusoidal curve with sufficiently high uh, uh, visibility or the minima sufficiently well there are sharp criteria sufficiently well well defined then you have an entanglement and only an entanglement that can explain what this is so in that experiment uh, that's the paper we, we, we were able to go up to plus 300 minus 300 and uh, we are we're, we're trying to go on for plus 1000 minus 1000 that's the photograph, it's a picture of a superposition of plus 1,000 minus 1,000. Uh, you now run into problems of with the spatial light modulators. They are not, they don't have a fine, fine enough structure anymore. So these, uh, we now have masks which are machined out of glass by a group in Australia, uh, Pink Koi uh, Land. And here's a superposition of plus and minus 1,000. That's just a cut out here with all kinds of impurities because the masks are not perfect. Uh, what you see here is an entanglement between one's photon horizontally or vertically polarized and the other one carrying this plus 1,000, minus 1,000. And we just now have experiments going on around 10,000, but then we will stop. <laughs> <laughs> so there is no limit. So, so basically any quantum number, no matter how big it is, can be entangled. So there should be no limit. What's so and I would claim that these experiments are the highest uh, quantum numbers which have been seen in such in entanglement. I claim this everywhere <coughs> because I want to be disproven. Maybe somebody says that I'm wrong. It would be nice to hear that. So another question we can ask, uh, we are shortly, uh, slowly running out of time. Well, we are running out of time anyway. This is a natural phenomenon. <laughs> Some people in this audience know much more about uh, about the running of time than I do. <coughs> I cannot say much here. Uh, another question we simply ask, it just as a footnote, I don't want to go into details, is, is, is uh, just for the fun of it, I mentioned before that we have this really rich and tangent state. Many, 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 many pairs of states. The question is, how many dimensions can we realize in the experiment? <laughs> And that's the ideal system, because you have these two quantum numbers, L and the other one, P or lambda P. So you have many, 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 many different states uh, on which you can project. And there is a problem which is called the spectral bandwidth of the of the laser. Oh yeah, that's the answer now. Uh, from a phenomenological point of view, it turns out that there is only a certain bandwidth of states which you can realize. Uh, it breaks down for large enough L's, namely when the pump beam is, 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 is too small. When the pump beam is too small, when it cannot accommodate the, 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 the modes, uh, the size of the modes, then, then you don't get a uh, down conversion. <coughs> this, is partly, uh, this is a practical answer to your question, <laughs> not, a, not, a, not a basic one. Uh, okay, so this, what we simply do is uh, we, we have this crystal, we create uh, uh, the uh, this entangled uh, 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 photons in polarization, where, which, where they have different polarization, which which can be, uh, uh, as, as I said before, uh, which can be transferred now into in the old experiments, which transferred this into into uh, uh, angular momentum states. Now we go the other way. Now we are saying, uh, we ask ourselves, what what kind of states are in this beam already, in terms of angular momentum? And so we identify, so we pairwise identify the states, and we look for the correlations. How do we pairwise identify the states? 
we look as we, we use a spatial light modulator here, <coughs> a spatial light modulator, which transfers this, which does the inverse than before. It transfers the state uh, which comes in, which has some orbital angular momentum, transfers it into a Gaussian state. Why do we do that? Because the Gaussian state can then be uniquely identified by having a small hole here, or in our case, a single mode fiber, a mode which is so thin that it can only support the basic Gaussian mode. And if that goes through and it registers at the detector, we know that it was Gaussian here. And by knowing what we programmed here, we know what the angular momentum was before, what the, what the state was before. And then we go through many, many, many possible settings about on each side about uh, 200 <coughs> settings and all the com combinations and look what we get in terms of correlations. Okay? So here are some pictures of what you, uh, again, the, 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 the principal uh, uh, idea above. Uh, so it's, uh, and, and here are some of the modes, how they look like, the more complicated superpositions uh, are absolutely non-trivial, like this is the <coughs> position of I think I should be going to the detailed discussion. Uh, the question is now is how to identify now whether you have entanglement in this in these dimensions. There is no such thing as a bell inequality anymore. So what you do is is, is a, is a so-called entanglement witness. Entanglement witness uh, being the following uh, uh, that you look at the at the uh, 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 at, the, at the visibility of the correlations in, again, mutually unbiased basis. If you have product state, then the visibility of these fringes I mentioned before is only maximal in one basis. And in the other, if it's a strict product, uh, strict, strictly uh, uh, product state, then it's only in one basis maximal. In all other bases, there is no correlation. And it turns out that, that there's a criterion. If there's visibility, the sum of visibilities along mutually unbiased bases now in the two-dimensional subspaces uh, of this huge system in Hilbert space, uh, if, that is, uh, if there's, a, there's a criterion now that gives you a number, you can calculate correlations, a sums over all visibilities in all these two-dimensional subspaces, and uh, when you have this number, then it tells you that the state is at least uh, at least entangled in uh, in the number of the uh, dimensions given by by this by this equation. So you find out how many dimensions you have. Here are the correlations again, which you can see the two parameters L and N, the coincidence rate, and so on and so on. Uh, and uh, it, f it turns out that our entanglement was at least of dimension 103. So that means that you have at least, this is a lower limit, it could have been better, 100 terms, uh, 100 terms in this, in this uh, superposition. So again, entanglement is not, a, is not a rare thing, it's a standard thing which happens in the universe. Now I come to the last, in the last few minutes of my talk, I, I come to the last piece of information, uh, which is this, kind of uh, uh, imaging experiment, which we recently did. And I want to ask the question, a uh, very provocative uh, 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 question. Uh, in, you know, we, we, all, we all know uh, what scattering experiments do. <coughs> and in the usual scattering experiments, you always have a, a sample. And you have something coming in. Could be a laser, could be an electron beam, neutron beam, you name it. And you look at the scattered radiation uh, as a function of the changes of the state of the of the radiation, like angry, energy, you name it. Okay? And the story is that in, in such a scattering experiments, the radiation that interacts with the sample always has to be registered somehow. And from that you conclude about the properties of the sample. The provocative question simply is, is this always possible? Is this always necessary? Is it always necessary to register that radiation in some way? And the answer is no. And that's what I'm talking about now. now. 
it go, the whole thing goes back, just in a nutshell, uh, goes back to an experiment which I think is one of the, to me, it's one of the most remarkable experiments ever done in, in quantum optics by Zhu, Wang, and Mandel. And it goes, uh, the idea was, it's actually acknowledged in that paper, the idea was the idea of, of U, is the guy, <coughs> also from the famous Hongu Mandel correlation uh, uh, tip. The idea is, that is a very simple one. The title is nice Induce coherence and indistinguishability in optic interference. Uh, I think the idea is very intelligent, it's very, 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 uh, very creative, very. Very nice. Uh, actually, Danny Greenberger, Mike Horn, and myself, he wrote it, we, knew who, we wrote in Physics Today in 1993, which is just two years after the paper was published. We call this a mind boggling experiment because to us it brings home, in the, to, uh, to, to, at least to me, I don't want to speak for Danny Greenberger or Mike Horn, it brings home in the strongest way, stronger than any other experiment, the role of information in. in the idea is the following. Uh, here's a sketch of the experiment, which was done uh, by these people uh, back at that time. Uh, you have two nonlinear crystals, and they are pumped by the same by the same uh, pump here. Okay. You have down conversion. Let us uh, just the kind of thing I, I, I mentioned here. It doesn't actually matter which type of down conversion. And uh, which means that uh, you have pairs of photons created here, you have pairs of photons created here. Now let us assume that the pump intensity is such that you can neglect all uh, events which create more than one pair at a time. Okay? There's only one pair at a time. So in the scheme, this means that you have one pair created, but it's created either in the crystal number one or in the crystal number two. And you don't know where this could be. Now, the, 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 the point is, we call, is this is a, an old tradition, which goes back to the old uh, uh, radio industry. One of the photons is called the either, the other one is called a signal. These are just practical names. They don't mean anything in this experiment. Now, you pick out the signal, photon from the two crystals and put it back, the signal photon, there's only one, and put it back on the beam splitter here and look for the interferences. The question now is, will you see interferences? Well, if you are not cautious, you will not see interferences. Because the idler photon here, the idler here, here, can always be used to find out whether the signal photon was created in this crystal or in this crystal. Like if I put a detector here, I know I know that the idler photon was created here. Okay. Now, what the idea of U was is let's align these crystals so carefully that by by the, the two modes, namely the mode of the beam coming through here, through coming from the first crystal, passing through the second one is completely identical here to the mode created uh, in the second crystal. If they are completely identical, then there is no way whatsoever how you can find out whether, whether this photon was created here or here. So there is no information present anywhere in the universe where the photon was created. Therefore, there is also no information present for this photon where it was created and it is allowed to interfere. And this is, this is not induced coherence. This is just making the two modes identical. OK? Now, this was, uh, uh, here is some of the, of the, of the algebra. I don't, want to, I don't think I need to go too much into this. Uh, you can look it up if you want. What is interesting, actually, is, is if I consider the following situation. Here, uh, what, here is, here is a, uh, 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 we, we show these two beams now in slightly different colors. Uh, they can be different colors, actually. Uh, if you consider inserting, it's always strange. Always strange. Does that happen to you too? Oh, very strange. Now, now this, 
the yesterday an equation disappeared from one of my slides. Today, one of the crystals disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why. I, I cannot get used to this thing. <laughs> anyway, so here's a crystal, okay? It has to the same with me. Uh, let us insert a, a phase here and a phase here. Let's call this phase phi and this phase gamma. Okay? Now, if this were a start, if, if that here were, if you were thinking of that as a standard interferometer, mm -hmm. what would you expect? You would expect that the, that the fringes back here depend on the difference between the two phases. But in that experiment, it turns out, no, the, uh, it depends on the sum of the two phases. Why is that the case? Now, this is, the, this is now the interesting point. It turns out when you when I look when I write down the states here, okay, well, already here. If I insert the two phases phi and gamma into the beam C and D, I have two phase factors which multiply the product state of C and D. Which means that it's the product state whose phase is shifted, and it is wrong to assume, it is wrong, I would like to emphasize it, it is wrong to assume that this mode is shifted by phi, this mode is shifted by gamma. No, it's the product state whose phase is shifted. Which also means that it is wrong to intuitively assign a specific phase change to a specific beam. And therefore now, therefore now, since it's the product state whose phase is shifted, if you make the two modes identical here, it means that this mode here does not carry any information whether there was a phase shift or not. <coughs> Nothing at all. There is no information in that beam uh, whether there was a phase shift, how big it was, or whatsoever. That's it, and therefore the phase shift shows up in the other beam. It shows, okay? it shows up in the interference pattern. And this is actually the lead, the, the, the lead part. So, so the signal mode inherits, so to speak, the phase shift of the idle mode here. Now, there, is, there are some discussion, uh, I don't want to go into details here, uh, about whether this could be explained as induced coherent, uh, induced emission. The answer is no. There are criteria already discovered by, by uh, Zhu, Wang, and Mandel. Uh, here's the real experiment. Here's the real experiment uh, which we performed. I should not go into any details because time is already up, I understand, right? So I should just give you two or three results. It's a rather complicated setup, as you can imagine, uh, which now brings about the fact that we have much higher interference fringes. The idea simply is we have here pump, create uh, pumping two crystals, this crystal, this crystal, uh, two different wavelengths. Uh, one wavelength is the signal mode, the other one is the idle mode, which goes back into the second crystal here, and then the two idles are simply discarded. Here you have a second uh, uh, the, the the signal mode is generated. These are dichroic beam splitters, so they reflect one wavelength and, and, and the other one is transmitted. And we superimpose the two signal modes here and we look at the two modes with cameras. Okay? The important point, uh, okay, now uh, here's a picture of the setup. I don't want to go into this detail. Just two experimental results, because I don't have any time anymore. Uh, here is the, the cardboard mask introduced into this idler mode. The cardboard mask. Which means that, the, that, the, uh, that the, uh, outside the cardboard mask, the idler mode does not uh, 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 pass through anymore. There's no idler intensity inside the edge. Which again means that on uh, for the idle mode now, for the signal mode, uh, for the photons which arrive here at the detector, the intensity of the photons is not at all changed by the absorption in the mask. It is only whether the photon carries part information or not. For the photons which, have, which, came, which correspond to an idle outside the hole, uh, these photons carry part information and therefore they show, show no interference. For the ones which pass through the holes, they carry no path information, therefore they show interference. And you see this here. 
Here you see the two, the pictures of the two outputs. This is constructive, this is destructive interference. And the outside here, this halo, is the signal modes which cannot interfere because the idle photon carries path information. Okay? Now, the sum of the difference is quite clear. Okay? Now, uh, uh, the same if you insert the phase object, for example, similar situation. Uh, you see, uh, uh, you can now inter in insert phase objects here. Phase objects which have the interesting property that the phase step is such that it would be invisible for this for this signal photon. The wavefront is typically 1500 nanometers, and uh, but it's very vis uh, visible. Uh, so, uh, uh, sorry, sorry, I should mention one important point, and that is uh, the the idler photon here, the one which passes the sample was chosen to be uh, around 1500 nanometers, which is the usual telecom wavelength. At that wavelength, no good single photon cameras exist. But good single photon cameras exist at 800 nanometers. So what, which was the, the wavelength chosen for the signal photon. So what we do now is we obtain a picture, photon by photon, uh, of, the, of, the, of this object at the wavelengths where nice cameras exist, but we get a picture for another wavelength. And that's actually that's a, 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 a trick. Now you can have you can have uh, images of silicon, for example, here, at 1550 nanometers taken with a camera at 800 nanometers, which is the case here. Now I should come to the end of the talk. I skip through all this. This is some considerations about resolution. So uh, some points in the experiment information can be extracted about the, the object without detecting the photons that he interacted with it, because the idle photon is discarded. <coughs> you, you get uh, grayscale imaging, phase imaging. Uh, you can actually uh, generalize this also to spectroscopy. This is obvious. OK. Uh, right. And that's it. And here are the people who did the work. Gabriela Lemos, Grade Club Kiewicz, Gerrit Kohl, Sven Ramelow. And one person, Victoria Boy, she's actually sitting here in the third row. She was working with me for one year. And here's again my group, the picture of yesterday. And I thank you for your attention. We're late for dinner, so I'm going right. to cut the number of questions to one. One. Does anybody have a burning, terrible question? Otherwise, we're going for dinner. Yes, yes there is a terrible question. Uh, so I was wondering how robust are the angular momentum states uh, against perturbations in optical fibers, for example? Or would they uh, build something that you could send through an optical fiber? Uh, the optical fiber is the challenge, because you would have to use a multimode fiber. Uh, that is something where we have no experience with. We haven't done it yet. Uh, the same problem arises when you go through atmospheres. And there have been arguments that you cannot use them for communication over distances of, of more than one kilometer. We just this week did an experiment over 150 kilometers. Because if you use good tricks, you can correct, uh, correct for, the, for the problem. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.